And the material quite often is sitting around the place. Yeah. It's just a yes. question of compiling it into something that yes. is readable. We're going to be making conversations about the perfect book count. It's important to think of these shorter books that we encourage people to publish as conversation starters. 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 How do you write the perfect book? My own experience was to write a short, focused book that was easy to consume, wouldn't take too long, and it would give readers the how to get started which is very much in alignment with all of the conversations that I have here on the podcast. So consider my surprise to find that today's guest also encourages business leaders to do just that. So listen on to learn where you will find the material you need as we're making conversations about the perfect book count. What I loved about meeting you, Mike, was that you have been able to encapsulate what business owners can be shouting about in their expertise because small is beautiful. 100 page books for business owners to write that tells people what they do and how they can help. Where did that idea come from? Is it from writing yourself? It, it came from a couple of places. Obviously, writing myself has been a big part of it. But I would say, believe it or not, I used to do a web TV show. Hi, I'm Mike Capuzzi. And on this episode of 3 and 3, I'm going to share with you a great resource for capturing demonstrations and PowerPoint videos, a website for building your marketing swipe files, and a great little book perfect for this time of year. Get ready for three and three. Maybe like 2010, 2011, I used to go to a local studio and it was a it was professionally produced and it was called three and three. And it was three ideas in three minutes. Wow. And so I would record these short, very pithy, very focused little web TV shows People love them. I mean, no lie. And this was back when I would travel more. I'd go to conferences and events. I literally gotten stopped. I was stopped at the airport. Someone stopped me and said, hey, I've seen your, you know, like there were people traveling to a conference and they saw me at conferences. They would say they loved it. And this whole idea, like, hey, I, only three minutes and I got three really good ideas. So I, I've always appreciated the power of highly focused uh, pithy, which is mean short and sweet content. And, you know, longer content has its moments. There's times when you need to write longer content, but I think in this day and age, people just prefer it. So yeah, I, I was like the kind of books that I want to write that I encourage many, many business owners to write a one hour book, a book that takes about an hour to read is perfect for getting that message across. It's di easily digestible, isn't it? And what I love about the three ideas in three in three minutes, it's kind of wow, highly suggestible, and it's it's enough to create that curiosity, isn't it? It's the it's the adventure that you don't know quite where that's going to lead you when you start having those ideas. So when you're dealing with a business owner who's going, I can't write a book. What you know? What could I talk about? What do you say to them, Mike? I try to dispel the myth and you know mysticism, if you will, of what it means to be a book author. Because I think a lot of people think it's a lot harder, a lot more work, a lot more challenging, and only special people can be book authors, right? You know, you're helping people in your business. So whether you're a doctor, a dentist, uh, you know, a consultant, or whatever, you are chances are you're helping people and chances are you're having conversations and conversations they count, right? Yeah. So it's not a big step to take those conversations and how you help people and just put them in a book format. And, and Wendy, listen, you know, and I know you're a fan of short books because I know your, your book, you know, Making Conversations Count was a shorter book. 
these types of books are ideal for most business owners. Now, this is not about being a New York Times bestseller or, you know, you know, featured in Forbes. Right. It's not about that. Maybe it turns into that. I'm working with a client right now who I think will eventually have that kind of book. I know she will. She's, she's building such an amazing business. So she, her first venture into book writing was a little ebook, which a lot of people do. But she came to us after a lot of research and said, you know, I love this idea. I'm not ready to write the big, you know, hardcover, you know, book that I want to put a lot of money into making, making a New York Times bestseller, but I want to write a real book. And these little short books that we, we publish for clients, again, it takes about an hour to read. So it's better for the reader and for the author. It's a lot less time and stress to write. My own experience of writing a book, Mike, was very much that I'd got 30 years of material floating around either (laughs) on scraps of paper or in archived files on the computer. And it wasn't until you started to go, well, how do I help and what can be the end result for the reader to make it worth their time and effort to read Mm -hmm. it? And the material quite often is sitting around the place. It's just a question of compiling it into something that is readable. I agree. Do you coach and help people with that kind of process? Yeah, we do. And, And again, the beauty, Wendy, is the more focused the content can be. So rather, you know, it is daunting to write, let's say, a 300 page traditional business oriented book. There's a lot that has to go into that. And oftentimes it's, it's a very wide range of content. In my experience, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, but as I, especially as I get older, I prefer much more focused content on exactly what I'm looking for. And I would prefer to maybe read three 100-page books that I can pick and choose versus having to wade through and trying to find the nuggets I'm looking for in a 300-page book. So I think focus, it actually makes it much easier for the author. So, you know, let's just take a dentist, for example, rather than writing a general book on dentistry and, you know, keeping your teeth healthy and oral health, you know, maybe she writes a book, you know, just on, let's just say teeth whitening, for example, you know, just something very focused that only certain people are interested in. And again, by, by being focused, obviously the reader is going to appreciate it. But I just believe it just it makes it that much easier, Wendy, for the author to curate that content, which she probably has all over the place, and just say, hey, I am just writing uh, a short book on teeth whitening. Not everything else, just this. And it, it, it just makes it that much more simple, if, the, if that's the right word. Because, you know, it's still work, but it, you know, it just makes it that much more simple for the author to get his or her thoughts together and on paper. I think you're right, Mike. It needs to be uncomplicated, doesn't it? Yeah. And yeah. I mean, we're talking about short books, but the same can be said for an ebook. It's likely that if you're in a generalist field of expertise, you could have 10 blogs, 10 pages long. There's your, already your 100 pages. It's small chapters. If you were to read a 10 page blog that was in a book that would take you an hour overall. So what's that? A seven or eight minute read every day to actually just take some really important information on that one piece of topic. It, it's actually a great way to curate the, the content mm-hmm. to deliver the book. And you've done that without even thinking about it. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes, Wendy, what happens, and it's, I've seen this happen more than once, it definitely happens for me as I'm writing these short books, is that as you're going through that process, it even brings you, the author, more clarity on your business, your service offerings, your product offerings. You see opportun- new opportunities. You see maybe some holes. So yeah, just that effort of looking at it a bit differently And we have a very, you know, I coach our clients on a very specific short book formula. So there's certain things that we, you know, we really highly suggest a certain flow and certain sequence, but when they go through that process, oftentimes, even though they're an experienced business owner, new things pop up because they're actually going through that process. 
interested to know then, Mike, how many of them do that process, you know, from the very start going, oh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to come up with 100 pages in a book that's highly <laughs> focused, and then go through the process and go, well, actually, I've got about another half a dozen topics. I could create six more short books, or do I just take the plunge and do a big book? That's That's got to be something that you see, right? Now, it's not everybody, right? I, I'd love to say all of our clients, you know, Everything goes as it's, as it's planned and they're, they're keeping to the timetables. You know, we have several, and by the way, we call our short books, we call them shooks. I'm all shook so a shook is a short, helpful book. That's our brand of nonfiction business book. So we have several multi-shook authors. And once they go through the process the one time, they're like, wow, I see the power of this. I try to do that in the beginning. So when we're when we're you know we're working through the initial phases of their shook, typically I can see if this should be you know maybe this should be two or three. We should break it up even more. And again, the nice thing about that is obviously it's easier on the reader, but it also allows the author to market his or her shooks in multiple ways now. Rather than just marketing one book to one kind of target reader, now they have three target readers, and it gives them even more opportunity. Well, it's a greater clarity as well, isn't it, in terms yeah. of being able to be specific to an audience. Yes. And that's something that we see and we read a lot, isn't it, in marketing is to be yes. consistent, but you know, not to be too general in serving all because you end up serving nobody. nobody so does. it kind of reinforces the shook methodology, doesn't it? Yeah. Again, I think, you know, in this day and age, with the fact that there are short tweets and short TikTok videos and all this stuff, which I really don't know a whole lot about, but my kids do. Um, <laughs> Same. <laughs> you know, attention spans are shorter. You and I were talking earlier. It's amazing about multitasking. Can we do this, that, and the other thing? So uh, the, the power of, you know, giving someone, we're talking, you know, a traditional paperback book. They jump on a plane and let's say, New York City, and by the time they land in Chicago, two hours later, they're done the book. And hopefully that book has encouraged them then to take the next step with the book author, because all of our shooks, Wendy, are marketing tools. They're direct response marketing tools, meaning they are trying to elicit a response from that small percentage of readers who really want what you have. So what examples can you share in shooks that have hit the shelves and you've seen that play out? Many of our shook authors are main street type business owners. So we have probably about two thirds of them are the local business owner who I always say just wants to be five mile or five kilometer famous in their community they want to be known as the dentist, the physician, the insurance agent, whatever it might be. And then about a third of our clients are more global, what we call worldwide authors. So my, like myself, I have a worldwide audience. You would have a worldwide audience. So you have you know, clients and followers all around the world. So what's, you know, what's really cool, Wendy, is to see the local business owner publish a short book and then use it in his or her community with tremendous success. And we've seen example after example with this, where by just simply publishing the book, putting it in their office as a display, offering anyone who comes into their place of business a free copy, exhibiting at local events, a very smart strategy for a lot of local business owners, Wendy, and I'll, this is a story I'll share um, to your question, is... So for example, and go back to it, ironically, he's a dentist, a client, a longtime client of mine who unfortunately has since passed away, but he was a, a very unique type of dentist. And he was a dentist that doesn't use mercury or fluoride in his practice. It was a very holistic approach to dentistry. So he had a very unique dentistry offering. And he wrote a shook about the, 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 the dangers of mercury, which is the typical amalgams they put in your mouth. Anyway, so you would think that the type of person who's interested in this type of dentistry, they're probably health oriented, more fitness oriented, they're worried about their health. So he, when he published his shook, he put, he went around to his community and found like the health food store owner, like the yoga studio owner, the chiropractor, anywhere where people with, you know, health that were interested in health would be hanging out and just put a little display with his shook to take a free copy. 
And uh, within the first month of doing, it, I think he did like, he did a lot. I think it was like six or 10, what we call strategic partnerships, where he just put his book out there. And within the first month, Wendy, he had three new patients, people come in and then become patients, each worth a couple thousand dollars to him. So that's the power of not only being a published book author, but leveraging it in unique ways to get it in front of your ideal target reader. So the question for listeners is, if you have a notion of being an author, what is it that you want that book to do for you Yeah, yeah. to be able to help the people that you help? Yeah. Mm. yeah there's the very, there's a, I say it in my own short, helpful books. It's all about how can you serve the reader? What does that reader want? What does he need? What is he looking for? And, you know, working together, we, we uncover that with our clients, you know, what is that thing they're looking for? What's that goal they want to achieve? And you write a short, helpful book around that. And just because it's a business book doesn't mean that it can't have some story element mm. to it. And because I think, so, you know, it's like, it's like podcasting, what we're doing now is storytelling, isn't it? In an, a different form. And when I wrote my book, I used examples and stories and relayed memories and examples of things just to put some context mm -hmm. to the content. And I think that that allows you to have some personality to a business book as well, which I think is possibly a fear business owners have is how can I write this if they don't feel particularly confident, you know, writing anyway? Yes, yes. It's a great point, Wendy. So let me, if you can, I, that, that's a great yes, point. I'm glad you brought that up because- Again, a lot of people do have this mistaken notion that, again, you have to be this world-class writer. I've got to be the next Shakespeare, the next you know, big thought leader. And again, that's not, you know, that's not the kind of book we're talking about here. It is a conversation that counts in print. And I always stress to when I'm talking to prospects and even our clients, I would much rather you focus on personality versus perfection. There's no such thing as the perfect book. I know, I don't know if you wrote one. I know I have never written a perfect book. There's always a mistake to be found. There's always something you would like to change oh, yeah. after you I wrote it. Version, I've got to do version two because things have yeah. changed too. Yeah, right. Yeah. There's no, so get it out of your head that I'm going to write the perfect book. Matter of fact, right before we uh, got on the, today's uh, call, we had to do an edit for a client because there was a word that was wrong and no one, you know, everyone missed it. And we're like, oh, we got it. Oh, there. We had so many people reviewing it and we just found it afterwards. But so focus on personality, not perfection means let your personality, that's what's unique to you. That is what makes people either want to be attracted to you or maybe repelled. And that's okay too. You're not meant to serve everybody, right? It's, it's the people that you're meant to serve. They're the ones you want to read the book, write the book for them and bring out those stories. I always say, write like you talk. Again, this is, this is a conversation that counts in print. So it doesn't have to be literary perfection. I think a lot of people, it doesn't mean you, it should be shoddy, but it, I think people appreciate authenticity and that me to you feel. And that's what I always encourage. It is about being quite conscious that you are writing to a reader. Yeah. And it, again, I would say you don't want to overdo it. You know, there's, there's always a balance in my opinion, but I do think it's important to think of these shorter books that we encourage people to publish as conversation starters. It is, it's not meant to teach the entire thing about whatever it is you do, you know, really meant to allow that, again, that focus. So I think the more we can just dive in there and, and, and help people with a very specific thing, the better off you are and the better off your readers are. Well, you make a good point there, Mike, actually, because I am known as the queen of conversation, as you know, telemarketing trainer and expert on starting conversations. So as a, a written author myself, and, you know, it's a great place to start a conversation. If you're networking, you've got a copy of your book, mm -hmm. you talk about the book rather than yourself. And I think this is what you can overcome some of those yes, yes. feelings in approaching for the coldness is, yes. 
you're giving something without asking for anything in return other than, to, you know, you just hope that they would read it and get some value from it. So, you know, if you think about when you're ringing somebody on, on the phone to introduce yourself, you want to really be presenting that same value to people. How better than to just to have encapsulated it into a printed book and to be able to hand it without any expectation? Well, again, you bring up a great point, Wendy. Another one of my famous mantras is, the ability of having a book focused or a book centric marketing strategy definitely is a game changer. So, whereas most business owners are talking about their services, their products, like, you know, ad nauseum, when you have a book and lead with the book as a giveaway, as a, a first contact, it changes. So, we're again, since I'm just talking dentistry today, whereas most dentists will be like, hey, here's our practice and you know, we do fillings, we do this. You know, it's very yeah, traditional. Some they have their... with some lovely smiles. Exactly, right? They're very traditional. That's, <laughs> that's what they do. Versus, you know, our dentist client who, you know, said, Hey, get my free book. You know, I'm looking at it right here. Are your teeth toxic? It's right over to my left. That was the name of his shook. Are your teeth toxic? It, changes. Now, not, again, not everybody is going to you know, get that type of marketing. Not everybody wants to read a book. But Wendy, I will tell you, people who read books, information gatherers tend to be more affluent. They tend to be better clients. Just there's a whole, they're more educated. It's just there's a, there's not across the board, but off, you know, more heavy on that. People who, you know, are readers tend to really be the kind of client you know, most of us would like to have. Well, I think I've got a new strap line for you then, Mike, because I would say that shooks are for seekers. They are. I love it. <laughs> it's actually really good. Shooks are for seekers. They're yeah. seeking information. And again, they have a problem or they have a goal they want to achieve. And a short, helpful book will give it to them in about an hour. I love that. Because I don't know anybody who hasn't got an hour spare if they really, really want to know about something. Yeah. That's and cool. even if they don't, even if it takes them, you know, two or three times, they pick it up, they read 20 minutes before they go to sleep. Again, it's, it's not a, a, a multi-week venture. I think it was Brad, Brad Sugars that came on the show. And, and he sort of sets people the challenge of 52 books a year. You know, mm. if you can read a book a week... You want to have happiness? Study happiness. You want to have wealth? Study wealth. You want to be successful in sales? Study sales. Right. So if you were to say that a shook is possibly the equivalent of three books. A book would be three shooks. Yes. One book, three shooks. Yes. Yeah. So you can you imagine if you've got like a hundred and what was it? I'm trying to do the math really quickly. 56. Something like that. Yeah. Right. That's that's an awful lot of seeking, isn't it? You know, that's like old. one every every two or three days that you could be just learning. And and I, I'm, I'm the same. I like to read. I've just had, you know, the knock at the door. And my daughter went, Amazon again. <laughs> I had two deliveries this weekend. <laughs> of what books. is it? What is it this time? And actually, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna show you now because it's Matthew uh, McConaughey's Green Lights, and it was John Barrows that recommended it to me on a recent Zoom call. We were just having a natter, not about anything in particular, and that came up, and I just did the prelude on Amazon to sort of get a feel for it, and I thought I can read that with his accent, no uh, sweats. So it's come today. And my daughter said, it's a good job you, you know, you haven't got a fetish for shoes because we would run <laughs> out of space. <laughs> well, you can do the same thing with books. I've got a collection myself. I'm like, oh boy. I just, I, I think I got four printed books this weekend, Wendy. Yes. I, I told myself that I was moving house and not allowed to buy anything, but books have been the exception to the rule. <laughs> I hear you. I don't think there's any harm in learning and there's got to be something to be said for even, you know, encouraging our younger generation. And if you are a business owner and you've got a family and you can say that you've written a book, that is going to have 
an impact and a wider impact, not just on the business, but in the people in your family and and aspirational for our next generation who, as we were saying earlier, before we came on, maybe don't do as much. So to that point, my oldest daughter is going to be a senior at college this year. Literally four years ago, almost at this very date today, she was going into her senior year of high school and she was home for the summer. Of course, she was working at a local veterinarian's office. So an animal doctor, she loves animals. And earlier that year, we had just rescued our first dog. So it, my entire life I always sort of went to a dog breeder. We've all, I've always had dogs, but went to a breeder, got a dog. But that year after our, our German shepherd passed away, we rescued a dog, went to a local dog rescue and a uh, great dog. She's a great dog. So that summer, before my daughter's senior year in high school, we were sitting around, I think it was July 4th weekend for us. I was trying to encourage her, like, what are you going to do this summer besides work to make a difference, to add some value? So we came up with the idea and she jumped on it of publishing a book about dog rescues. And we did a different type of book, Wendy. We did it, what they call a compilation book. So my daughter and I came up with the idea. She, she led the effort. And we found 26 dog rescue owners, my daughter being one of them, they each wrote a chapter. So rather than having to write an entire book, now they're just writing a chapter about their dog and the dog rescue experience and how it changed their life. That was on 4th of July, July 4th weekend, 2018. By Labor Day here in the United States, which is in September, so like three months later, the book was done. It was called Dog Joy. She raised like $6,000. So we, we, all the money raised, we donated to the dog rescues in the book. And what we didn't expect to have happen, but happened was she got a ton of local publicity. She was interviewed for all the local newspapers. She was featured in a local mag, like a real magazine. I live in the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area. So she was featured in a regular, like a magazine for 30 people to watch who were under 30. And then she used it as part of the college application process and got into every college with scholarship. She had people, you know, universities offering her scholarships. One dean wrote a letter back to her. Hey, I'd love to have an author in our freshman class. So this is what it means to be an author and the lives you can change. And she was 17, 18 at the time that she did it. Probably could have done a lot more since. I really, she embraced it, but didn't embrace it as much as she could have because she went off to college. But that's the power. And I think any young person can do something very similar. And again, we raised a lot of money, hopefully changed some lives. And, and that, I always thought that was a very cool story. I think that's a brilliant story, Mike, because I know as well that lots of listeners are business owners who are going to be going, I can get my son or daughter to do that. I'm going to sow that seed with them because it's that kind of self-motivation, isn't it? That actually makes you stand out from the crowd of other applicants, whether that's, you know, going for an application at college or going for a job interview. So I think it's an absolutely fantastic idea. And, and we didn't go into it, Wendy, with that in mind. We were just like, hey, this is a summer project. It'd be cool. It'd be raise money. But it, it, and again, maybe in the back of my mind, I had it could be a differentiation point for her in the application process. Interestingly enough, a very well-known marketer about two years after the book was published asked me to do a training for his business owner group. And I did a training, something like how to, I, I think the title was like how to get your son or daughter to, into any college of their choice. And I went through step-by-step step how my daughter did it. So um, if anyone's interested, let me know. I have that training somewhere. It was just a you know Zoom recording. And uh, you know, I, I, I think a lot of, it, it could be a, a process that's easily repeatable by a lot of young folks. Maybe one step further would be to take it to colleges and see if the colleges would embrace it as a summer workshop. Well, it's funny you say that too, because <laughs> I was a guest speaker via Zoom the first time really when COVID was at its max, and then more recently for a professor at a university in Mexico. And he was teaching a graduate course on business. And he found me through one of my shooks on Amazon and invited me to be a guest lecturer. And then I guess it was, I was good enough that I was brought back as a, a second time. And I, I, in real time, I said, listen, why don't you guys? And I, I said, we'll publish it for free or help you for free. 
there's the class. You've got 20 students, 30 students. Each of you write a chapter. And, you know, there's, there's a, a, a short, helpful book on a specific topic. He hasn't done it yet, but uh, it, it could be part of a college project, a high school project. Oh, I think it's anything that we can encourage our next generation to get involved with is always a, gets a round of applause from me, Mike. We're going to carry on that conversation in just a moment. But first... So my Wendy Woo tip today, well, of course it has to be if you're struggling to pick up the phone and talk to strangers and you're not sure that there's a piece of that puzzle that's missing, that's holding you back from getting those conversations started and making them count. Of course, it's simple. Go and buy my book. It's available on Amazon. We've kind of got to the point where I just really want to know what that one conversation was for you, Mike. (laughs) This is the part that, you know, where I have no idea what's coming next, but it's a conversation that you recall as having changed your life in some way, shape or form. So what was it all about, Mike? It is a distinctly profound conversation because it really did change my life. And it's in the business context. So I'm not, it's not a real, you know, it wasn't a personal one. It wasn't a, you know, something like that. So it was in 2007, Wendy. And I, I don't know if you've ever heard of a gentleman. He's very, he's big internationally, but he's got a huge following in the United States. His name's Dan Kennedy. Dan is a world famous marketer, copywriter, probably has written 30 or 40 books, huge following, has helped so many people. He used to do big conferences and all this. Well, in 2007, he was speaking at a conference, and I'll I'll cut to the chase as quick as I can, but long story short, I won a contest that he was sponsoring. There was three winners to be announced, and I happened to be one of the three winners. And the what the winners won was a lunch with him because he was at this conference and he was going to break away and, and, and sit down with me, the three winners, and have lunch with them, which is a big deal for the world I was in at the time. Turns out, Wendy, the other two people who won did not show up for that lunch. So it was me and Dan Kennedy. This would be like you and Matthew McConaughey. Literally, like he's that profound in the business world that I was in. So we're in this, he, he's at his event, he's speaking at his event, he has lunch, we're in a hotel, we're, I remember it was like the basement of the hotel, we have lunch, it's just he and I sitting across, and I had met him once before, he, he knew of me, but he didn't know me. So I was kind of starstruck, I gave him a really nice gift, we're talking, and towards the end of that, uh, whatever it was, 45 minute lunch, which again, just one on one, there was a product I had created for myself before I went into book publishing hundred percent, I was a marketing consultant. So I had created this cool little product that allowed you to add handwriting and hand-drawn doodles to your marketing collateral. At the end of our lunch, I wanted to bring it out and get his feedback on it. So I remember it was a, at the time it was, it was like almost like a software product on a CD-ROM. I remember sliding the CD-ROM across the table and then I had a little print out of these doodles and stuff. And I said, Hey, Dan, I came up with this thing. I explained it really quickly. I said, what do you think? And and Wendy, I can just remember he lit up. He's like, you know, he went from sort of this kind of like, oh, I got to get this lunch over with to like just being amazed by this. I even have the picture. I, I, I grabbed the picture with him and he had this smile on his face. Little did I know that was the start because he was so enamored with this product and this thing that I created he announced it to his world and it blew up and made me literally a very international name in his world. We sold tens of thousands of seats of this thing that I created. Uh, It's still alive. It's it's called copy doodles. And it's now, it's now a website where you can go in and get these doodles. But Wendy, I can't tell you it, I, after that, I was speaking on stages. I was, you know, in books being featured because I created this really cool thing that marketers could use. And it was all because Dan Kennedy and that lunch and that conversation. 
Oh my goodness. So was it a one course, two course, three course lunch? I don't know. I think there was a salad. Yeah, it was probably three courses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet you wish you'd have. Uh, I remember it was pitched. in the like the lower level of this hotel. <laughs> I'd have been pitching that at the starter. <laughs> oh my! Well, again, I was I was sort of like I didn't know what I had. I thought it was cool, but I was like, oh, is this too corny? Would a guy like this think this is corny? Interestingly enough, I mean, I spoke for him a couple times. He and I, I, I went to his. You know, I, we became, you know, I wouldn't say friends, but much friendly, right? I actually did a consulting day with him at his home a couple of years later. And uh, all we talked about was copy doodles. And yeah, I mean, if you Google copy doodles, you'll see it's still, it's all over the place still. Isn't it interesting though? Because what strikes me from that whole situation was almost being held back for fear that it wasn't mm-hmm. really anything. Yep. Yeah. Just like our authors. Yeah, so you knew you were onto something, but it's kind of that fear of rejection from somebody that you really truly admire. Yes, yes. Go, that could, you know, it's make or break, isn't it? And then, you know, bef- you knew that your time was running out, so it was like now or never. Yeah, and and and, and by the way, Dan Kennedy, I have it over here. He featured my daughter's book and he had a newsletter with 10, you know, I don't know, 10,000, a print newsletter. So something that went out in the mail, I'm looking at it. He featured my daughter's book, Dog Joy. He sent a check for a thousand dollars out of the blue to support the effort. He was, cause he was a, he's a big horse rescue person, but that's how much of a fan, you know, the relationship tightened all because of that conversation. That's incredible. It's actually yeah. given me goosebumps. Yeah, it's it's very cool. Yeah, it's very you cool. You just, it, it, it's like my strap lines. I always say this. You just never know where a conversation will lead. You just have to be brave enough, don't you? Yeah. To ask. Yeah. Whoa. Well, I didn't know Dan Kennedy, but I feel like I know him a lot better. There's some more books, by the way. He's got some excellent books online. So you have to, when you, when you, when you're ready to buy a couple more books, (laughs) check out Dan Kennedy. I've got to have to find a little space on the shelf for Dan Kennedy, but it sounds like a really cool guy. And, and this is the thing, isn't it? You know, you, you meet people like that and you, you, I don't know why, why do we expect them to, to be, you know, untouchable? And yet we can, and they're probably some of the kindest people because of the celebrity that goes around with being a genius. Gosh, well, I, you're going to make me think now, next time I go to lunch with somebody, something <laughs> something really incredible could happen, couldn't it? You know, life is, I, I teach this to my daughters all the time, like one little decision could really have a tremendous negative effect on your life, or it could have a tremendous positive effect. And you have to be aware, situationally aware, and just always sort of have your, you know, in the marketing world, I always call it your marketing radar on for potential opportunities. Again, my daughter didn't really see the big radar opportunity for her book that we published, but it happened. I didn't necessarily think that lunch was going to turn into something special. Yeah, Just have your, that radar on. I always encourage listeners to reach out to guests. So where's the best place for them to find you? With your okay, I'll give two places. I mean, my main website's MikeCapuzzi.com. Our publishing company is BiteSizedBooks.com. I put it out there, Wendy. If anybody hears this and is interested in how my daughter did this, I have that training somewhere. I'm happy to you know, put it up on a server and let people download it. They can uh, just reach out to me. There's forms on our, my site. And then if it's okay with you, I, I actually wouldn't mind giving some of your listeners or all your listeners the opportunity to read three of my shooks for free. Ooh. online the magic of short books the magic of free books and the magic of shooks but I'll, these are the print versions but uh the digital version which you can read on your phone or on your computer it's hidden on my website so if you go to mikecapuzzi.com uh forward slash magic you'll be able to uh get the links for all three of those shooks and hopefully you'll read them and be inspired to write your own short helpful book we can never have enough authors and I've always, I'm always looking for an excuse for a little bit more shelf space. So, Mike, it's been a delight. Thank you so, so much for all of your generosity. It's been great speaking to you. Wendy, thank you for the uh, in-depth questions. I really do appreciate them. Thank you very much. Now you've listened, will you consider writing your own book to market yourself? Mike and I do hope so.
Let us know what you'll be writing about. And even better would be for you to tell us when you plan to publish. You've listened to the conversation. Now it's time to go check out the show notes for all the fabulous goodies. Mike has left at listeners a special gift link and there are also a couple of links to read the 100 page book and the magic of shucks. So go check out those show note links or go to the website makingconversationscount.com. Next week, we're going to be doing something a little bit different because believe it or not, we've reached the 100th episode of Making Conversations Count. Stay tuned. It's one not to be missed. We're going to be making conversations about the three things that make a business successful count. Mm-hmm.